folks. Thanks for joining us. Um, so Gavin, uh, Bitcoin, just give us a kind of state of play of the market at the moment. If uh, anybody here has got a few in their electronic wallet, uh, are they likely to be making more money in the next uh, next wee while, or uh, what's going to happen? It's been a rocky road recently. Very recently, Bitcoin volatility has shot way up, and nobody knows exactly why. It seems to be a lot of Chinese people are deciding to buy Bitcoin for some reason, because the price on the Chinese exchanges has been shooting up over the last month. So they've uh, had a bit of volatility in their stock market. Maybe they're looking to, to, for a safe harbor? That's possible, yeah. Uh, I don't speak Chinese. I don't hang around a lot of Chinese people. Uh, so I don't have any inside knowledge on what's going on there. But fundamentally, is the technology secure? Is it going to survive? Because there are some limitations on its potential to grow as more people want to use Bitcoin. And I know you've raised that issue. I have. I mean, the last year, I've really been pushing to scale up the system uh, with some fundamental changes that we need. That's a great problem to have. Whenever you have too many transactions to process, that means you're being successful. Um, and Bitcoin's an open source software project. It's an open protocol. And so the process of making change is uh, messier than I think a lot of people would like. I mean, if you're a company, you can just decide we're going to roll out 100 new servers. Uh, if you're an open source software community, getting the governance right and figuring out how to make decisions uh, is hard, and we're actually right in the middle of that process. So you're trying to win consensus towards whatever those changes will be? Yes, trying to get consensus on exactly how to scale up. And if you get, I say if you get you know, 10 engineers in a room and ask them to solve a problem, you'll come out with 11 different solutions. So um, that's, that's kind of where we are with you know, how should we scale up Bitcoin, what's the best solution, or if not, what's the best solution, what's the solution that everybody can, uh, can agree to. Uh, and what, from your current position now, are you confident that that agreement will be reached? That, you know, for instance, the limitations mean that at the moment it can handle seven transactions a second compared to uh, what the tens of thousands that, say, Visa can handle. And that is the big problem uh, if you want more people to, to be using Bitcoin. I am confident that it's going to get solved uh, just because everybody agrees it's a problem that needs to get solved. It's, we're just quibbling over exactly how. And nobody's actually quibbling about the fundamental technology anymore, are they? And that's the really interesting thing. Blockchain technology is almost reaching the mainstream. It is. I mean, the cover of The Economist had an article about blockchain technology, the technology behind Bitcoin. And this idea of a, of a global public ledger or even a not global public ledger, but public ledgers, um, I think is really taking off in the finance world. Uh, the, there's a lot of people see a lot of opportunity to, to get rid of some middlemen and to make money. And obviously, if you see a way of you know, cutting out a middleman and making more profit, that's a strong incentive for you to check out this, uh, this new technology. But a lot of people uh, look at Bitcoin and, and, and perhaps they bring their own ideological baggage to it. So perhaps some of those people are a little bit nervous when they see people like the Bank of England talking about you know, distributed ledgers being a significant innovation or having far-reaching implications for the industry. Are people worried that the, the kind of ideology or the kind of the, the values, if you like, of Bitcoin and blockchain could now be taken over by the people that they dislike, the financial sector? I think there is a little bit of that worry. Um, I think there's a little worry that if it grows too fast, then kind of the, 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 some ideals will be lost along the way. The ideal of central de being decentralized, having nobody in control, permissionless innovation. Um, I'm not worried about that. I mean, the, the, the technology is open. I can't see it becoming closed anytime soon. It's, it's very immune to kind of outside influence, even if I... If I was evil and I wanted to do something to like, compromise those ideals, I'm not sure what I could do, frankly. Right? I don't have that much power. Uh, so I'm, I'm confident that as Bitcoin grows, it will remain uh, you know, a system open to anybody to innovate, uh, a system that, that's open to anybody to participate in. And I think those are the principles that, that really are important to keep in mind. So you're, you're, you're confident that, that that sort of principle will, be, will remain. Um, but what about when you have banks and others now talking about private ledgers? You know, so they're still distributed, but they're private. So we'll have a close shop on that. There's, there's two interesting observations about private ledgers. One of them comes from um, some academics who wonder if there are six banks that get together and have a, a private ledger that they all agree on, why can't they just use existing database technologies, have a MySQL database that they all agree, they all run copies of, they all synchronize with each other? Um, and that's, I think that's kind of a valid point, although you know, Bitcoin evolved in a very harsh world, right? Bitcoin evolved as this open source technology 
vulnerable to, to hackers uh, on the open internet. And I think because it evolved that way, it, it really has some strength at its core that uh, if you look at like commercial databases, it's the opposite model of, you know, we're, we'll put a moat around our network and we just won't let anybody get in. Um, and so I think, you know, going more towards the Bitcoin model of, you know, we're going to assume that there will be attackers uh, gives a lot of strength. And I think that interests a lot of people. The other observation is Bitcoiners who, who, who I think don't understand why these private blockchains are appealing. Um, they're not designed to compete with Bitcoin. They're not designed to be a new currency. They're not designed to be an open, uh, open system where anybody can innovate. They really are designed for problems that these financial institutions have today. And so I think there's a role for them there, and, and I think the technology will work for them. So that openness, is that central to the values of, of, of Bitcoin and blockchain? And you know, what about uh, the mysterious uh, Satoshi Nakamoto? Um, what was his sort of motivating force behind creating this whole thing? I may be projecting a little bit, but I think Satoshi was a little bit like me, and I think, I think Satoshi was, was inspired by his idea, uh, partly just for the technology. Um, he certainly knew the history of the cypherpunks of the 90s who, who wrote a lot about digital cash and who you know, created the foundation of the security and uh, cryptography infrastructure that we're all using every single day. Um, so I think the technology was a huge motivator for him. And if you read his writings, I think he was also frustrated with the current system of, of money and banks and currency. Um, and he saw Bitcoin as a way of doing an, uh, you know, a, a, an alternative that would be more open, more free, uh, less subject to manipulation. Yeah, and you've used the term how Bitcoin and has evolved. And in a sense, that's an interesting a way to look at it because it's almost like you're saying it's being tested by that evolution. It, it therefore has its own built-in protections because of how it has actually evolved on that open uh, system. And then when you see quotes again, this you mentioned The Economist um, saying, you know, just recently, the technology behind Bitcoin lets people who do not know or trust each other build a dependable ledger. This has implications far beyond the cryptocurrency. So sitting here now uh, without trying to preordain what anybody might do with it, what do you think some of the things are that we'll see uh, this technology being used for? I think we'll, we'll definitely see uh, financial institutions who maybe have some trust amongst each other, but maybe they don't trust each other completely, kind of working in the design space of these permission ledgers. I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I heard the term fren frenemy used, right? We're competitors, but we still want to cooperate uh, on something. And I think uh, a you know, private permissioned ledger that everybody can agree to, everybody can support in terms of you know, technology infrastructure. But there's not 100% trust there behind even these large financial institutions. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And in the, in the you know, very short term, I think we'll probably see a lot of progress there. I mean, longer term, um, I mean, you look at the places where, where you're, you're, you're performing a transaction where there's not complete trust, or maybe there's no trust. So, you know, we've seen that in the, in the black market, right? Black market was an early kind of adopter for Bitcoin. I wish it wasn't so, but it is. Um, and At least it, you give, yeah, you give the black market a, an opportunity to, to get past that trust issue. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I mean, you, you see the same thing with, uh, you know, the evolution of video, right? Where you don't want to trust your video store not to tell somebody else about what movies you might be renting. And so, uh, you know, online video was a lot of X-rated. Uh, video to start and now you know YouTube is huge and it's all cat videos and I think you'll see a, a similar evolution um, where you know you go from like completely untrusted environments where Bitcoin was really was the only option to places where um, there's less trust so like cross-border payments are often there's there's less trust there because you're physically far apart and I think you'll see the evolution of, of Bitcoin kind of moving up that spectrum of trust. And probably the last place you'll see Bitcoin is, is, is venues where there's a whole bunch of trust already. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mom and pop grocery store probably trusts you not to steal the groceries and run out the door. Um, and so yeah, I, I think that that can be, you know, if, if you're looking to forecast the future, look at how much trust is there between participants. And then also, you know, what are the, the completely new use cases that 
just weren't possible before. Things like machine-to-machine -machine payments, where you know, a machine has, if, if, if you're a robot, you can't open a bank account, right? Uh, you just can't, but you can have a Bitcoin wallet. And we're seeing this with artists. I don't know, uh, there's a really interesting art project where you can send some Bitcoin to a machine. And if the machine gets enough Bitcoin, then it thrives and reproduces. And if it doesn't, then it will die. Um, and so you see these kinds of experiments happening in the art world. Um, people talk about self-driving cars that own themselves. People talk about robots that you know, act on your behalf and have some money that they control. I um, mean, all these things are interesting ideas. Most of them will probably fail, uh, but some of them will probably stick, and it'll be exciting to see what happens in the next 10 or 20 years. And, and I suppose it's, it's, it's these guys here and others like them who are going to come up with the ideas that, that take advantage of, of the technology. We're, uh, we're, we're also seeing some governments even getting interested in it, perhaps governments that have suffered from corruption problems where trust in their own officials is an issue, looking at, say, property ledgers, land registry, and so on. So it could have real benefit there in countries where corruption has been an issue. It could. I mean, yeah, that, again, you know, it's that trust equation, right? If you've lost the trust, how can you get it back? And, and having technology that everybody can see, everybody knows how it works, that you can't directly control, uh, you know, kind of sidesteps that trust issue. You don't need to spend years and years swearing on a stack of Bibles that you won't inflate away your currency or confiscate people's goods or lose all the land title records because the person doing the land title records happened to be corrupt or you know, whatever. Um, so there are, I think, a lot of applications there that, again, people will, will experiment with. And do you think the fact that now we're seeing, you know, governments perhaps experimenting in this, banks taking it on, the economists covering it, the Bank of England commenting on the potential, is Bitcoin is blockchain mainstream? Is it really that mainstream yet? Not yet. Uh, I think it's still an experiment. And I think it will remain an experiment until it becomes boring, until there is not a cover article in The Economist about this exciting new technology, until it's buried somewhere in the back page that just talks about yet another project that's launching somewhere in the world. Um, and I hope we'll get there. I think we will get there. Yeah, I mean, it is, I mean, even if you look at the, the financial size, it's still 3.3 billion, uh, roughly, in terms of the value of the currency itself. So compared to, you know, what we're trading, you know, with, with standard currencies, yeah, it, it's, it's... It's a drop in the bucket. Yeah. I mean, it is really small. I mean, at technology conference, everybody knows about it. But still, you know, probably more than half the people I meet, if they ask me what I do and I mention the word Bitcoin, maybe they know, maybe they don't. Um, and most of them certainly don't have a, a good understanding of what it is or, or what it's good for. And then just on the other side of that, though, uh, how fundamental will the changes be that it, it enables, do you think? I don't know. I mean, that's a good question. I, I, I tend to be pretty moderate in my view of, you know, how big of a change can any one technology make? Um, so I tend to be fairly moderate in my predictions for, you know, the, the, the change that Bitcoin will have on the world. I'm sure there will be changes that I don't imagine, and I'm sure there are changes that I imagine that just won't happen for whatever reason. Um, and again, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Okay. Well, we'll keep a close eye on it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Gavin Andresen. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.